part of the presentation. <laughs> yeah, something like that, yeah. Well, thanks for coming to CSIS. Uh, my name's Jim Lewis. We're going to talk about uh, quantum computing, the Google Quantum AI Lab tonight. Our speaker is Hartmut Nevin, who is the engin an engineering director at Google and the founder and manager of the Quantum Artificial Lab, uh, which makes a lot of the stuff you read about in the papers when it comes to quantum. Um, previously, he was the head of the visual search team. So does that mean you're responsible for that thing where you can put in like Google image and it finds the picture? Mm -hmm. Oh, well, there you go. Okay. <laughs> I didn't know that until I was reading the bio. <laughs> Good to be prepared. Good to be prepared, that's right, but not around here. Um, he's won a number of competitions for uh, his work on facial recognition and software, but we're not going to talk about facial recognition tonight unless you insist. Um, prior to working at Google, he started two computer vision companies. He got his doctorate in 1996 uh, with a thesis on dynamics for vision-guided autonomous mobile robots. That's very timely. Um, and then became a research professor at USC. So I'm really looking forward to this conversation. Here's what we're going to do. He's going to talk for a few minutes. Then I'm going to annoy him with questions. And then we'll open it to the audience. And we'll take it from there. So Hartmut, thank you for coming. Yeah. Thanks so much for spending time. So hopefully we can elucidate quantum computing a little bit over the next hour and yeah, keep it very interactive. So. Maybe just to introduce the topic, I don't know what your backgrounds are and how familiar you are already with this field, but maybe it might be worth mentioning that quantum computing has been... Is your, com your microphone? Keep... Can, Can you, you hear me okay? Down? Yeah, check, check. Okay. Not enough. All right, appears to be working. Go ahead, sorry for interrupting. So, quantum computing as an idea has been around for a number of decades. Actually, we often credit uh, Richard Feynman, the famous physicist, uh, with having come up with the idea. So in around 81, 1981, he realized, actually Richard Feynman was running for a part of his career um, what today we would call a, a data center. So he was responsible for a group of computers, which were literally a mix of human computers with some uh, digital machines. Um, and he, being a quantum physicist, he appreciated that certain computational tasks he was interested in, for example, computing the structure of a molecule, that no matter how fast digital computers would become, he would probably never be able to compute these things. And we will explain in a second why this is. So he coins this phrase, nature is not classical, damn it. And if you want to simulate it, you better make the simulator quantum mechanical. And that's essentially the idea of a quantum computer. So now fast forward to last year, um, our team at Google was able to uh, publish um, important result, which has a somewhat unfortunate name. We didn't come up with it. Uh, it's called quantum supremacy. And it means um, that you have achieved a situation where your quantum processor can do a certain benchmark task quickly, which in our case it was 200 seconds um, was the time our quantum processor prototype needed to solve the task. But if you would have given the same task to the top one classical supercomputer, which is currently the um, summit machine at Oak Ridge National Lab, that machine would need 10,000 years to do the same task. So there's a huge difference. And that's just the start. So the um, difference in time will continue to grow very different, very rapidly. So. With this, we are now in an era where quantum processors, for the first time, can do certain computations. And mind you, the computational benchmark task we use is a very exotic mathematical problem. We often say this is a problem 
nobody has in their real life. <laughs> but nevertheless, now you can do something that classical machines cannot do. And now, of course, the race is on to find applications for these processors that are of commercial or of scientific interest. And that's one of the focus um, of the work we have. Maybe I stop here. As okay. An introduction. Well, you um, you had the quantum AI lab. What what are you guys up to? What are you doing? Give us some examples of the projects you're working on, the the goals you're after. What does quantum AI lab do? Okay. So after the supremacy result was in the bag, actually our whole lab was sort of focused on getting this done. Yeah. But once the publication was accepted by Nature and users would come out, then we focus on, in startups you should only have one goal, but actually we have two goals. So one goal I just mentioned, we try to think of with these chips, what are useful applications. And the second um, thing we focus on is, it's important to realize these early chips, they only allow for a limited number of operations. And so so you, the way you should envision this is you, you have a set of qubits. So this chip had 54 qubits, stands for quantum bits. And like with classical bits, you come in and do manipulations on those qubits. And, but our current chips, they are not error corrected. That means that every operation you do on your qubits adds a little bit of error um, to the end result. And that ultimately limits the number of steps we can do. Now you may think, oh, I want a correct result at the end of my computation. That's actually asking for too much. You would be happy if only 50% of the time you had the correct result. Why? Now you just run the same computation a few times and you will get to see the correct result. Nevertheless, because every operation adds a little bit of error, it limits how many operations you can do. Because 50% you might still compensate, maybe even 99% error you can compensate, but there's actually a quadratic relation in, in there. So the higher the error of your end result, the more repetitions you need to do, and eventually this just becomes distasteful. So that means our current quantum algorithms they have to be rather short. We can do about a thousand operations or so, and we have to stop. And thousand operations is not much. The, the famous quantum algorithms like Shor's factoring algorithms or Grover's search algorithms, they need millions of operations. So that leads to our second big goal. We want to build what is called an error-corrected quantum computer. Um, essentially a quantum computer where in each operation, the error is so small that you don't have to worry about it, and we can run really long algorithms with many operations. So these are the two goals. Do you want to describe what the chip looks like or how it operates? Is it super cooled? I mean, just in general terms for people, what, what is a quantum? We all know what a semiconductor is. You have one in your pocket. What's a quantum chip? So to better I don't have a... Some way to show pictures. As yeah, is. sorry. If you go on the internet and you put, let's say, Google quantum chip, you will, you should see rather beautiful pictures of the, the chip or the um, dilution refrigerators where they are housed. So let's put it like this: If I would, if this chip would lie around here, you would notice that it's any different than the chips that you have in your phone or in your laptop. But at first glance, it looks from the outside. You know, you have connectors, it looks like an integrated circuit, not too different. Um, the, there are different ways how you can represent quantum information in quantum bits. Um, what we use at Google is we use superconducting electronics um, to represent mm -hmm. our qubits. And superconductivity is only happening at rather low temperatures. For example, you can take aluminum and become superconducting at uh, one Kelvin. So you want to at least be below one Kelvin. But because quantum information tends to spread rather quickly, we need to insulate our qubits really well or insulate our chips really well. And so we have these devices that are called dilution refrigerators. 
and they keep um, the chips at a very cold temperature, 10 millikelvin. If you were to compare this, if you park yourself in interstellar space between two galaxies, over there it would be three Kelvin, so that is warm compared to the 10 millikelvin in the, at the business end of the dilution refrigerator. So I often like to think of the place where the chips sit in sort of the zen-like place. It's like perfectly dark, perfectly quiet, shielded from everything. That's where the quantum information can unfold unperturbed. Do you want to tell us what Nevin's law is? Do you uh, mind doing that? Thanks, flattering. It's I know it is. <laughs> no, I, what the heck? <laughs> I, I mentioned um, earlier that the um, amount of, or the difference between a classical chip and a quantum chip will grow tremendously. Mm. And to, to be a bit more specific about this is, I mentioned that a quantum algorithm is essentially a set of gate operations applied to your qubits. And I also explained that we can only have a limited number of gate operations, let's say a thousand for our current error rates. Mm. Now, there is our hardware people will make the gates better. So they lower, let's say, the error rate every year by half or so. That's the direct analog to Moore's law. So we, our gate operations have lower error. That means we can do more gate operations. Let's say lower error by two, then we can do twice as many operations. And that happens every year or so. That's um, Moore's law, and that is an exponential growth. But it also turns out, if you were to say, let's say if our CFO were to say, ah, building a quantum computer that's really expensive, you know, we have huge data centers, can we not just use those to simulate the quantum computations? And it turns out the answer is no, because the amount of classical compute power you need to simulate a quantum algorithm with a certain um, computational volume is also exponential in this volume. So the volume doubles, and with increasing volume, you also get a second exponential. The exponential cost of classical simulating is there as well. That makes a double exponential. And actually, I was told this, this is the first example we know of of a double exponential um, growth curve. Oh, that's. I think the core of Nevin's law is the double exponential. Um, let's switch gears a little bit. Um, what This might be distant, and you can say how distant, but what should consumers expect as a result of quantum computing? Yes. I didn't prepare you for that one, did I? No. <laughs> um, so people often ask, hey, there was actually, uh, last week I was in, in Davos, in the World Economic Forum, there was a very cute scene. So there, we, Google was hosting a lunch, and there was a fireside chat um, that Sundar Pichai, our um, CEO, gave. And then a person stood up and said, oh, I'm the um, CEO of Manchester United. And he asked exactly this question. In 10 years, what do you think is the most impactful technology? And Sundar went like, oh, you are the CEO of Manchester United? I have so many questions for you. <laughs> 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 Turns out Sundar is a huge soccer fan. Then he went on, oh, sorry, but I was so excited, I completely forgot your question. So the CEO had to repeat. And so to my delight, um, Sundar answered, saying that he thinks the most impactful technology in 10 years will be the horizontal integration of um, quantum technologies with artificial intelligence mm. technologies. So how does the person on Main Street uh, feel that? Um, I think in multiple ways. Um, let me, uh, I think I should, um, to, to answer this question properly, let me in inject one thing. Um, if you look at different computational modalities, then it turns out that an abacus and a modern digital computer from a theoretical computer science perspective, they're really in the same class. But a digital computer and a quantum computer are not in the same class. Mm. Why is this? 
because if you have a computational task, let's say you want to add two numbers, or you want to multiply two numbers, an abacus and a digital computer do it with the same number of steps. Granted, digital computer is much faster in each step than the abacus, but they do the same number of steps. In contrast, a digital computer and a quantum computer, in certain cases, a quantum computer can do a task with much fewer steps. And even if each step even takes a little bit longer because there's so many fewer steps, that's where the speed up comes from. Mm -hmm. And we only know of a rather small, let's say a few dozen algorithms where that is the case, where people have shown, oh, if you had quantum processor, you can do it with, with less steps. So you should think of a quantum processor as a coprocessor, a little bit like a graphics um, a GPU, a graphics coprocessor, that will accelerate certain tasks, but will not accelerate other tasks. Uh, for example, something Google would care for, like encoding a YouTube video, uploading it to our servers, and eventually serving it out, you watch the YouTube video. You could run all of this on quantum processors, but it would be a waste, you would not gain much because for this algorithm it's not known that you can do it with fewer steps. But then there are other areas where you can do it with much fewer steps. And now, sorry, this is a little bit roundabout coming answering your question now. What are these areas? And one area is Feynman's observation. We call this Feynman's, uh, Feynman's uh, killer app, mm -hmm. which is a simulation of quantum systems. So whenever there are systems where quantum effects play a role, and think of a solar cell. A solar cell, at the core, it's a quantum phenomenon. Now, a photon comes from the sun, bong, shoots out an electron, so you have a charge separation, that's a quantum process. So you want to make your solar cells better, a quantum processor would help you compute it. Um, electric cars, you know, these days, I don't want to make this too concrete, but I, actually I vowed my next car should be an electric car. And Porsche had this beautiful Mission E concept car. Have you seen this? So this was their yeah. <laughs> electric 911. So then it eventually came out. I was really disappointed. It was nothing like the concept car. It was much more bulky. It looked more like a Porsche Panamera family car. And why did it come out so bulky? Nah, because making well-performant batteries for an electric car we are not so good at it. You know, they're, they're heavy, they charge slowly, they don't hold all that much charge. But if you would understand the electrochemistry in a battery much better, then you could make much lighter and you had a huge competitive advantage, let's say relative to Tesla or the other way around. Mm -hmm. So in the future race between a Tesla and a Porsche, if one had access to a quantum computer, the other company didn't, the one that doesn't have access to the quantum processor will lose out because with a quantum processor in hand, you will be able to accelerate your battery development very quickly. Do you want to and give a, a timeline for this? Uh, when, what are we looking at in terms of two years, five years, 10 years? I mean, when we're already starting to see some applications of quantum or at least we're starting to see some, when, when you talk about these industrial applications, what do you think the timeline is? So when, I, so if it explains that the lower the error, the more operations I can do, the more complex my algorithm can be. Mm -hmm. So currently we don't fully know to model certain problems inside a battery. Let's say you want to develop a new <coughs> electrolyte or a new mm -hmm. cathode material. Um, how large the algorithm has to be. So if worse comes to worse, a, Porsche, a Tesla or a Porsche would have to wait for the error-corrected machine. So then that's still 10 years out. Um, but we already have chips now that can do something beyond classical. So we have already some examples for quantum simulation algorithms that compute something beyond what classical machines can do today. And these are rather exotic problems where only small, let's say, phase transition in certain condensed matter systems. That's only interesting to a small group of physicists you never <laughs> heard about. But this is where it starts. So certain things we can do now, and we are pretty certain to deliver substantial commercial value in about 10 years. And how we interpolate between those two points, 
we don't fully know that yet. I wasn't going to ask this, but it's just too tempting. How are quantum algorithms different from, say, a regular good old algorithm or the algorithm you'd use with a digital computer? Is there a difference? How do you do? What's the difference when you write them? Yeah, I give you Sorry. an example. That, no, that's actually a very valid question. And I, I think I have an example um, that is not too hard to understand. Mm -hmm. uh, let's, let's pick an application that's very dear to the heart of Google, a search. In particular, this is the simplest case of search. It's called unstructured search. Unstructured search, you can imagine as follows. I'm going to put a huge closet here with a million drawers. And then I take my dirty socks, now, let's say a ball. I put a ball into one of those drawers. And your task is to find that ball in one of the drawers of one million. So how many drawers will you have to open to find the ball? Not a trick question. It's, in average, it will be half a million drawers if there are a million drawers in the closet. Sometimes you get lucky. It's in the first drawer. Sometimes you get unlucky. You have to do a million. In average, it will be half a million drawers you have to, to open. But if this would be a quantum closet or a quantum RAM, it would only take you a thousand operations to find the ball with certainty. Actually, the, there's a scaling difference. So the best classical algorithm you can write, it will be, computer scientists call this, will be linear in the number of the drawers. So it's mm -hmm. half a million, or if there would be a billion drawers, it's half a billion, but it scales with the number of drawers linearly while the quantum search algorithm goes to the square root. So it's a square root of a million, that's a thousand operations. Mm -hmm. So and that goes to what I explained earlier. A quantum processor draws its advantage from being able to do certain algorithms with fewer steps than classically possible. This might be a little tricky, but what would investors look for when it comes to applying quantum? What would the, you're now on Wall Street, and so what do you look for? Do you look for... Porsche coming out with a better battery? Do you look for Google improving search speed? What, what, what are the investment horizons here for quantum? I would say all of the, the above. I mean, ultimately, the way you naturally offer quantum computing resources through a cloud service. You know, these refrigerators, as cool as they may look on a picture, you don't want to have this under your desk, mm -hmm. it's uh, clunky, or somebody has to fill in the liquid nitrogen, you don't want to do that. <laughs> so have some experts tend to these fragile machines in a data center and have them give you an IP address where you can send your search problem and say, okay, find, mm -hmm. find this item in the database. So this would be kind of a cloud type application. Absolutely. We are actually internally, we are already going through testing of it. We have a a new facility in Santa Barbara, which will be an industrial strength um, quantum cloud service, cool. where you have a whole battery of these dilution refrigerators with the chips. And then users will be able to access those to hopefully do everything we talked about so far, quantum simulation, better search, applications in machine learning, and so on. So it would be quantum as a service? Yes. OK, that's pretty cool. OK, something to look forward to. A uh, couple more uh, questions, and then we'll open it up to the audience. But when you think about, so we're in Washington. Welcome to Washington. Um, what are the policy issues that you think quantum brings up? What are the policy things you'd like to see out of the government, any government? What, what are some of the policy things we've, we've talked about? What do you need okay. to change or do? Yeah, so one reason we came here, or I have done previous visits, is that to build the error-corrected quantum computer is an expensive affair. We estimate it will cost between two to three billion dollars to um, finish this journey. We currently feel we are a few years ahead of the, the next competitor. We also have actually a pretty firm plan now how to build the error-corrected machine, but it's expensive. And while Currently, after the supremacy result, you know, we sit pretty, you know, our executives uh, like us. But so currently, everything's good. Google can uh, afford such a program. <laughs> but 
I've been in technology for long enough. I had two companies on my own, so I always have the paranoia, like what is your financing plan, B, C, D? And I could easily see that maybe in a few years, I mean, it's a long time, it's about 10 years um, to get to this place. So it could easily be that there's a phase where things don't go so well, a few bad quarters, and it might not just be Google as a company, this could be the companies who spend this money. Um, if they suddenly need to save, what gets cut first? It's typically those longer term efforts. Mm -hmm. So I'm worried about this, even though right now it's a hypothetical worry. But what would really secure American leadership um, and in keeping our advantage would be, for example, to do the following. The Department of Energy or other government organization could or government should use its enormous purchasing power hmm. to steer the market or catalyze a market for quantum um, cloud services by rewarding the early risk takers. And you could do this in a market-driven way. Uh, so Department of Energy, it's actually a proposal we made to them, why don't you take, let's say, a billion dollars, you give it to researchers at national labs or give it some of this money to a National Science Foundation, and then let the researcher vote with their feet to buy quantum cloud mm -hmm. services, not just from Google, so we're not just here to lobby for us, but they can decide they can buy it from IBM or Rigetti, um, INQ or Google. They can decide from where to buy, so, from, so they could buy for quantum cloud services from approved vendors. And that would not generate a win or a profit um, for Google, but it would offset some of our cost, and that would secure um, the development and increase the probability that we indeed get to an error-corrected machine. When you look around the world, where do you see the best research being done on quantum? Not just in the U.S., so we'll give, we'll give you Los Angeles as a given, but where else, uh, where else do you see quantum? I could do this for AI off the top of my head, I couldn't do it for quantum. Yeah, so when you say quantum, we should make a distinction. Quantum technologies are broader than quantum computing, mm -hmm. which we do. So quantum technologies, there are three main buckets that are often named. There's quantum computing, that's everything we talked so far was in the bucket of quantum computing. There is also quantum metrology. The same way you get this quadratic speed up in search, you get also quadratic mm -hmm. speed up in the sensitivity of pretty much any measurement. There's what's called measuring at the Heisenberg limit, and there's what's called measuring at the shot noise limit. I apologize for the jargon, but that's essentially measuring with classical devices, measuring with quantum devices. With quantum devices, you get fundamentally a quadratically higher sensitivity, mm. and that matters, of course. If you want to, for example, measure EEG, um, other signals from the brain, um, heart activity, or you have a magnetic sen sensor in the Atlantic and you want to know where's the closest um, submarine, then quantum sensing would be useful. So that's second bucket, quantum sensing or quantum metrology. And the third bucket is secure communications on which you cannot eavesdrop. And so your answer, unfortunately, would have to be bifurcated according mm -hmm. to these three buckets. Um, in quantum computing, I would say US institutions are leading. Um, many other places in the world realize this basic fact, you know, like two aircraft manufacturers or two um, chemical companies, one has access to quantum resource, computing resource, the other one has not then the one that does not will be out of the competition. And so many places like Europe, China, Russia realize they also want to have their own mm -hmm. machines and have programs to various maturity. Mm -hmm. Could be a bit more specific. How big do you have to be? Is Israel a player in this? Because they are in other places. Um, they have excellent individual researchers. I'm not aware of a concerted okay. Israeli effort to build a quantum yeah. process. Are you a big believer in uh, quantum races? The, the oh, national okay. race, so it's like we're in a race. Every This is Washington, so we have to be in a race with China on almost anything. So, <laughs> um, so 
even though we are pretty confident that we are currently in the lead. There's a Silicon Valley saying, no, only the paranoid survive. So there's always <laughs> sort of a hit list of your biggest worries. And we are indeed most worried from an as of yet unknown competitor out of China to beat us in the race to the error corrected machine. Because China as a society just has the ability to steer enormous resources in the direction that they deem strategically important and go. And mm -hmm. China so far did not have the um, equivalent of US national labs, but they will found some now. Actually, to our information, they plan to have three different labs. And they will actually all be devoted to quantum information. That's mm -hmm. how critical they see this field. So the, you would put China as the, the, this is sort of a leading, this is leading the witness, sorry. China is the biggest competitor. Uh, China is the. I, I think mid to long here, term is yeah. the, uh, would, <clears throat> would be our biggest worry, yes. Okay. Um, let me see if there's questions in the audience. Does anyone have, well, we've got bunches. We'll just go around and around. Actually, we'll start in the back since there's only one. Uh, do we have a microphone? I think we do. Here it comes. And could you please introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Lauren. Um, and I have a question sort of at the intersection of your policy statement and also some of the research that you kind of talked about. Um, so you were kind of saying like, oh, you know, like the DOE, for example, uh, they could help reward sort of early risk takers, right? Mm -hmm. But that's not necessarily how scientific research investments by the government are thought about, right? They tend to invest sort of in that edge of knowledge. Okay, so with that sort of caveat, I guess my question is, as you mentioned these applications such as looking at um, batteries and like electrochemistry and actually understanding that. And folks have been doing quantum simulation for quite some time, which I'm assuming since you only have three buckets, not four buckets, you're rolling up quantum simulation into quantum computation. Mm -hmm. So then I guess my question is, is would the policy be better focused sort of looking at these interdisciplinary areas where you could actually make those big gains? And what sort of areas besides electrochemistry do you see that as being the way that um, you know, like the DOE or NSF could actually contribute to moving quantum forward. So yeah, to, to simplify it, I think first, it's probably a good idea to just invest in increasing the raw quantum compute power. You know, this, um, the more gate operations I can do, the better it is. Once you have that, then of course you can look, okay, shall we go into pharmaceuticals, uh, quantum biology, um, Shall we invent high temperature superconductors to um, have a lossless uh, grid? You may know that 2% of the world's uh, energy production goes into an old school um, chemical process for nitrogen fixation. This is a Harbor Bosch process that makes um, uh, our fertilizers. 2% of the world energy production goes into that. Um, however, Mother Nature is a step ahead of us. Um, there are bacteria that can do nitrogen fixation at room temperature, at one atmosphere um, of pressure. So if we had a quantum processor with just about 100 logical qubits, it's believed we could understand how this catalytic process works and change this important industrial process. So yeah, there will be a huge list of um, areas where then you can apply this raw compute power to, and that could be separate individual funded programs. Okay, great. Why don't we move up the row? Uh, hold up your hands again so we can, uh, the first row I've got, why don't we do this one here and then we'll move up and go down the row. Thank you. And uh, remember to introduce yourself. Mark Bardwell, Homeland Security. It's easy to envision a not so distant future where quantum computers are, are available to adversaries, whether nation states or, or perhaps even organized crime who want to use them to break into encrypted uh, systems, military, banking. What, what, would you, what would you suggest security-minded people do um, in, a, in a future like that? 
Mm -hmm. yeah, very good question. Um, so the, the first thing to say in this context is there are novel encryption methods. Um, they're called uh, post-quantum crypto methods that allow to encrypt information in a manner that is immune to quantum attack. So for institutions like Bank of America, CIA, name it, they would all be able, I think, to switch in time. Actually, research has already started on this and is accelerating to deploy on post-quantum crypto systems to secure information so that once there is a big enough machine that can crack current codes, um, would not be able to see those messages. But there's a second thing to be said, that if you send a message with just RSA encryption right now with not too many bits, and somebody stores it today and then gets in 10 years hands on a quantum computer, they will be able to read it then. So if you care for your secrets to stay secret for longer than 10 years, you need to switch now. Yeah, if you know the uh, story of Venona, the code breaking Soviet code in the 50s, which wasn't broken until the, I guess, the late 60s or 70s by someone named Bill Kroll and others. Uh, that's a good point. I hadn't thought about that. But people do save this stuff, and they do come back and try and uh, read it later on. So uh, that's a scary thought. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, yeah, in the communities is unknown. Yeah. Uh, let's start over here, and then we can go down again. And... <clears throat> Hi, my name is Tony Spadaro. Uh, I have, if you'll indulge me, I have two quick questions. The first I know you can answer. The second is going to require a massive leap of imagination. Okay. The first is, uh, Let's do would you discuss second. how you can uh, interrogate and control qubits without introducing error? Mm -hmm. And the second is, I'm old enough to remember working on computers that were made up of vacuum tubes. Mm -hmm. And the challenges there were the size of the of the components and the heat dissipation and the little animals that were living in them and all of bugs. That. And the predictions in those days were you'd bugs. never see a computer small enough to fit on a desk, <laughs> let alone what we have now. If you can use your imagination forward, I understand using uh, quantum computing mm -hmm. as a service for people who want to do molecular modeling and, and other kinds of development activities. But do you ever see us moving away from the, the millikelvin limits and things like that? Yeah, I mean, if history of technology is any guidance, um, we should assume this. I mean, we currently use superconducting technology with certain ways to manipulate our qubits. Um, and we think this is the best bet to get to the error corrected machine right now. But again, going to the only the paranoid survive. I tell our hardware group listen, many of you are renowned Nobel Prize candidate. Um, uh, physicists, experts in superconductivity, so naturally you have a bias to work with this. But if we see any other technology, let's say silicon qubits or uh, photonic um, implementation passing us by, the only not forgivable sin would be not to pivot uh, quickly enough. So we would shamelessly switch to a different technology as soon as we feel they have a better chance of succeeding than us. And I very much hope that one day, and as beautiful as they are, we get rid of those uh, dilution refrigerators and we will have uh, quantum computing at room temperature. Yeah. So. Did you have a second question? First, just how to interrogate the Oh. Um, this is actually, um, yeah, quantum readout is a, a whole lecture in itself how you do this. By, uh, <laughs> Yeah, very gently probing. And, yeah. we'll, we'll, we'll note, we'll note quantum. Actually, sorry, I should maybe give a little bit easier answer. At the very end, of course, you can just collapse um, the wave function or the, the quantum state and just read it out once, but then the computation stops there. So while it's processing, I'm, I'm tempted to explain. Uh, let's not go there. I was uh, tempted to explain quantum error correction, where you continuously do have to measure without disturbing. 
we'll come back to that. <laughs> we had one up in another one in the front here, so thanks. Thanks, Carl. Thanks very much. Vaga Maradian from Defense and Aerospace Report. Uh, and I, 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 too, on Friday and Saturday nights would do punch card computing in the 1970s because all the real students were out. So if you were a high school kid, that's where you had to go when uh, you could get the computing time. Um, well, follow up on one question. There were three different quantum categories. You talked about the first one, but not about the other two, about who has the lead in it, including on um, secure uh, on, on, on secure communications. So quick update on those. And then from your standpoint, what are the military applications of this, right? Because there's this tendency of believing that quantum computing, it'll be quantum everywhere and it'll be in everything. And you've sort of dispelled that a little bit. From, but from a military application standpoint, where does quantum go? Where does quantum not go? And how do we need to think about that as you're building, right? You have to skate to a hockey puck that's 10 years down, for example, right? Venona was compromised in the late 1940s, but we continued to collect Soviet message traffic. And then when we cracked it, we could benefit from it. So how do we need to think about where it's used and how it's used as we craft our strategies today for 10 years from now? Okay. So quantum communication from what is visible and what you know, a person like me without uh, access to classified information um, knows is uh, China seems to be in the lead when it comes to secure quantum communication. They have this satellite called the Misius, um, which sends out um, entangled pairs of uh, photons. And essentially, there's a way quantum communication works. You can essentially check whether um, somebody interrogated your uh, photons um, as they get distributed. And if you notice this, then you do, oh, somebody eavesdropped, so let's not use that bit. You throw those photons away, you do it again, and you check again, did somebody eavesdrop? Um, if not, then that's a bit you can use. And uh, China is very committed to advancing uh, quantum secure communication. And that is, hearing from <laughs> some folks here in Washington, is of serious concern in the sense that certain parts of communication have gone completely dark and there's only sort of this collateral indirect information. Let's say the volume of messages being exchanged that can still be seen, but the content of the message is not anymore. So quantum communication, at least from what's visible, China seems to be in the lead. Just as an aside, I met the guy who's the head of the Missius satellite program. Yes, John Ray Pan. Got to hear him speak and to the limits of my knowledge, he appeared to really know what he was doing. Yeah. So I took them quite, <laughs> you know, sometimes the Chinese say, you know, we have, you know, flying saucers and it's like, ah, yeah, sure. But in this case, uh, he struck me as the real deal. No, he's an Anton Seilinger student. Anton Seilinger is a famous um, physicist in Vienna and is, I think his PhD is a student. So yeah, no, he knows what he's doing. <laughs> the technology is actually not in certain ways, all, not all that difficult, but uh, China has been more deliberate in deploying it. Hmm. Now, I was told, but that's only hearsay, and some in this room might know way better than I do, that the US has an, a classified program that is actually ahead of the publicly known Chinese program, but that's just hearsay. I don't know if that's correct. Well, don't expect anyone here to confirm it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, more questions. I think you had the oh, second sorry. part, what oh. does it mean for the military? Okay. Now, this is in two big application areas. One is quantum simulation. Um, so this has, let's say you want to have lighter weight aircraft, you want to have paints that are um, invisible to radar, you want lithium oxide batteries that in principle could have um, higher energy density than kerosene and would not leave any heat signatures. Mm -hmm. um, it, it goes on. Um, Quantum computing applied to machine learning and uh, AI will be, of course, an area that is in, in many places of interest to the military. And as an example, I would say if you had two drones, one was trained um, by using quantum resources and the other one wouldn't, it would literally appear like hitting an, an alien adversary. You, would not have any chance if you don't have in your quantum control um, 
preparation of your quantum control circuits, quantum resources involved um, would be a, yeah, a very unequal fight. Uh, we've got another one. It just means we cannot be second in that. <laughs> when you got your doctorate, did you have to do an oral defense? Because this is kind of like an oral defense. <laughs> uh, we have another question up front. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I thought it was interesting when you said that uh, the post-crypto, uh, post-quantum crypto is already invented. So I'm wondering. Not that, invented. Well, it's being these things. Of, perhaps. They need a little bit time to mature because often, uh, and cryptography often hinges on a function that is sort of in one direction is easy to compute, but the inverse is very hard to compute. And whether the latter is true, sometimes you don't necessarily have a pencil and paper proof, but you need to try in practice whether it's the case. For example, factorizing a large number is believed to actually be doable in polynomial time, that is mass lingo for, it shouldn't take you all that many steps, but in practice, nobody has figured it out. And similar um, for the post-quantum crypto, you need to kick the tires for quite some time to see is it really secure. In that sense, these things, suggestions have been made and they are being vetted right now, but it will take some time until we really trust a post-quantum cryptography. That, that's rather a, an answer to my real question, my total question, which was, at this time, are people developing software that they would be ready to run in 10 years. I can see these great applications you're talking about are not going to be just suddenly done as soon as we get to 500 qubits. They're going to require a lot of tire kicking. And I'm just curious, is it possible to prototype the software which would be run in the future to do some of these applications? Can we start now? Um, in the area of cryptography or in, oh, no, I actually I was thinking you've given many more examples in, uh, in uh, chemistry. So, for instance, you know, uh, rotating or finding the structures of proteins or whatever sorts of things. Anything. Is, yeah. Are people trying to develop software in advance of the development of the hardware? Yeah, we, we do this, of course, all the time that we try to either by analytic methods just prove this will work. If once we have the error corrected machines. This was the early days of quantum algorithm design, was entirely this. No quantum computer existed, nobody could try anything, so you can just sit down and reason about it. Okay, if I had quantum resources such as superposition, entanglement, all the words you said we shouldn't use. Oh, that's right. Sorry. <laughs> but if you had those resources, <laughs> you can prove then it will work better. Um, now, they, let's say at Google, forget about anything quantum, we rarely ever write a proof that a certain algorithm will do a certain task in a certain amount of time or has a certain scaling. We just empirically test it. And a lot of our algorithms are heuristic algorithms. You couldn't, let's say, running a, a neural network, there's no guarantee that it will do a certain task correctly. You just find empirically this to be the case. So heuristic algorithms are much harder to check um, and see what would happen if you had a big um, quantum computer. But we try to, for heuristic algorithms, try to run it either in simulators. So up, up to about 30, 36 qubits, you can still simulate it as not too crazy costs on classical machines. I think the records are somewhere in the 40s, but then it gets already expensive. Um, or we use the chips we have now with 50-ish uh, um, qubits to run early examples and try to get a sense how well will this perform once we have more qubits. But it turns out it's often difficult to glean how good it will be from these small-scale um, examples. One of the things that I see there's a couple questions, and we'll get to them. But one of the th when I was preparing for this, I read somewhere that in the run-up to quantum supremacy, which does sound like a Bourne movie, in the run-up to quantum supremacy, um, you had to actually ask for more compute power from Google 
you had to ask for a bigger quota so you could mimic on classical computers what a quantum computer could do, is that right? Yeah, this was actually sort of what led me to the discovery in, of, of Nevin's, what now is called Nevin's mm -hmm. Law, um, that when we had the chip ready, the Sycamore chip, which is 54 qubits, so we, of course, you want to know, hey, is my chip doing the right thing? And then how do you check it and compare it to a classical computer? So let's say eight qubits or 12 qubits I can still do on a laptop. And I remember like early December of 2018, we, we started doing these tests. Then later that month, we went into the 20th of qubits. So we needed a really beefy um, desktop machine to, to check the results. And then a few weeks later, I had to call indeed the system administrators and say, sorry, can we get a quota of a million cores? Because now we want to check sort of in the uh, 40s of qubits. And this is essentially this double exponential value. That was what impressed me is, wow, even Google's bumping up against the ceiling on this stuff. That's pretty cool. Um, two, uh, we had other questions. And I have two questions. We have three questions. Do you have time? Yeah. OK. And then I have two quick questions. So we'll go, why don't we start here in the back, and then we'll do uh, the two in the front. Uh, hi, Dr. Nevin. Brian Smith from Beacon Global Strategies, a consultancy. Um, you made a judgment that, and I think you quoted security professionals on this too, that uh, before quantum computers can factor large numbers, we would have the quantum-resistant defenses ready. So my question is not to challenge that judgment, but to understand it. What is that based on? How do you explain why that is? So I'm not a cryptographer by training. It's not really my um, field. Uh, these um, schemes should point you some, to some nice articles. I recall that there was a nice article with a headline like post-quantum crypto schemes. There's, for example, lattice-based encryption, it's called. This is one of the best contenders for uh, post-quantum um, crypto scheme. Um, also, to your earlier question, Google has already deployed, um, or we did a test where a certain percentage of our traffic was encrypted with um, what's called Last Hope, <laughs> um, or New Hope, Last Hope, something like this. Um, post-quantum uh, quantum immune crypto um, technology was need, uh, used to encrypt some of our traffic just to see. Because one nuisance you get is um, that the ratio of bits you send across the network um, to the uh, net uh, bits describing your message gets much worse. So, so you have to put much more packaging around your messages to make them secure against quantum. Often joking, if you are a manufacturer of uh, internet equipment, you should invest in quantum computing because the, the amount of traffic will go up quite a bit when these oh. methods get deployed. Interesting. OK, one in the front here, and then uh, one here, and then we'll close it off. Okay, uh, my name is uh, Jack Krapansky, uh, unaffiliated, but I do a lot of writing on quantum and AI. Um, question about education and training. And since we're in Washington, uh, back in 1958, because of Sputnik, uh, Washington decided that we were hopelessly behind in science education and didn't have the science teachers and whatever. Are we in a similar situation with quantum? Are we doing okay? Are we, are we, uh, you know, at the front of the curve? Are we behind the, the behind the curve in terms of both uh, graduate level and undergraduate, do high school students need to know about quantum? What's the earliest point that you would, at this point in time, want us to be investing in more in quantum education? Yes, I think, let's say if um, the Google Quantum AI Lab would be its own company and I would have to send a letter to shareholders and then you have to list the risks to your business. Um, the, limited uh, talent pool of uh, people who can build uh, quantum hardware, write quantum software, is already um, hurting us now. You know, like you know, the other internet giants like Amazon, Microsoft, 
they all in this game as well. IBM and pretty much any person I ever talked to, they look at multiple offer letters, driving up the prices. You know, in some ways this is nice, yeah, good <laughs> or expertise is in demand, but it's bad if you want to grow a larger team. And at this point, we are also still strongly dependent on talent sourcing internationally. So making sure that it's easy for non-US nationals to um, come in and get the proper visa. You can already see that there are hubs sprouting outside of the US, like in Toronto, it's just for certain nationals easier to go there and do this kind of work than coming to California. So it's, and of course, workforce development in the US. Today, actually, we were at uh, the White House um, talking to uh, OSTP um, about starting as early as it's in high school programs to teach some of the basics of quantum mechanics that can be taught at a high school level so that even if you don't go into physics or computer science, I think as a future business leader, you should have a rough idea what quantum physics has to say. Disturbingly, I was at a dinner last night with the head of a, one of the big Asian tech giants, a friendly Asian, uh, and he said exactly the same thing, that his biggest problem, he does their... Uh, innovation investments is talent shortage that he had lots of jobs he couldn't fill here he works he's in Silicon Valley too he couldn't fill them and so this looks like a good problem to think about and how we make progress okay last question <clears throat> now I have a couple but they're short Hi, I'm uh, Tom Stefanik I'm with the Brookings Institution and um, a lot of problems in industry and, and government and, and technology are, are, have constraints that are not fundamentally um, computational constraints. They're sort of organizational data constraints. Uh, you mentioned personnel. Um, if you're doing detection like uh, metrology, or, um, there's signal to noise ratio constraints. There's all these other external constraints. Have you identified some problems where actually the computing part of it is the active constraint. You... Yeah, I would say so. I, I could give you many examples, but one that pops to mind. Um, as you all know, um, machine learning, in particular in the form of um, deep neural networks, has been tremendously re successful recently. But it's not as rosy as it may seem, um, because you often need huge amount of data to, to train these. And even though we say, are oh, we in the age of big data, big data typically means polluted data. If you have large data sets, there are typically always mislabeled items in there. Current machine learning systems can deal very poorly with that. They degrade in performance, so that makes it often necessary that human operators have to painstakingly sit with the data and, and clean it up, making the deployment slow. Um, we have developed quantum algorithms which would be able to learn from polluted data in the sense that they could look at the data set and say, oh, these data points I just can't interpret, um, they don't make sense to me, I just limit myself to this set of data. It's a little bit like a smarty pants kid in school that goes to the teacher and say, no teacher, what you just told me I think is wrong. And similarly, um, a quantum enhanced machine learner would be able to discard mislabeled um, examples automatically and that would tremendously speed up um, your learning rates or in turn reduce the amount of, of data you need. And that's a purely computational limitation. So when we were warming up for this, uh, something you said in the discussion, and I can't quite remember what, made me write down a Turing test. So when you think of, and everyone knows what the Turing test is, it's when you, know, the, you, you can't tell it's a computer. How, how does quantum affect Turing test? How does the combination of quantum and AI affect Turing test? Right now, it's not, I, my impression is we're not that close, but how will quantum change that? 
So yeah, this um, yeah, it leads to an area which I'm actually very excited and, and passionate about, but it's uh, a tricky area from a, a science perspective. What, what I'm getting at is when we, we talk about uh, artificial intelligence, we make it often sound like we understand human intelligence really well, yet there are sort of basic lines of reasoning like, oh, let me have some more of this, it's tasty, or no, hey, I'm not going to do that because it's going to hurt. That's this sentence goes through our mind every day, many times from childhood on. But there's no equivalent of this in a machine. So nor computer science, nor um, neurobiology, nor physics has a good model of what constitutes conscious experience. And this is a very difficult area to make, to address with the methods of experimental science. But I do believe that with the concepts of um, quantum physics in mind, we have a new or interesting new avenues to understand what constitutes conscious experience. That's great. Any final words for policymakers here in DC who might be watching, or what would your 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 parting words be here to the? I know you'll be back, but I have one, but I won't say it. Because <laughs> <laughs> Well, well, that might be a good note to end on. Please join me in thanking our speaker.